There's something about a drink that's welcome and cheerful. There's something about a drink that's warm and friendly. There's something about a drink that gives a man a lift. But there's something about too many drinks that's mean and ugly. There's something about too many drinks that can mess a man up. Peculiar stuff, this colorless liquid called alcohol. It's worth a few minutes to consider what it is, what it does, and how it should be handled as a drink by those who feel that it has a place in the social world they live in. Yale University School of Alcohol Studies has as its director one of the nation's leading authorities, Dr. Howard W. Haggard. Contrary to popular belief, alcohol is not a stimulant. Our work done here at Yale and parallel studies by other scientists all over the country have demonstrated this medical fact beyond question. In its effect on the human mind and body, alcohol acts as an anesthetic, like ether. The pickup effect is more like taking off the brakes than any positive drive. Here is the chemical formula for alcohol. C2H5OH. And this is the formula for ether. C2H5O, C2H5. Notice how similar they are in chemical composition. In moderate amounts, alcohol acts as a mild sedative. From it, you get a feeling of relaxation. In larger amounts, the deeper anesthetic effects appear with loss of controls. Unlike ordinary foods, alcohol does not need to be digested before it's absorbed into the blood. When liquor reaches the stomach, almost half of its alcoholic content is absorbed through the stomach wall into the bloodstream within an hour or so. The rest of the alcohol goes into the small intestines, where absorption continues until all of the alcohol has been taken into the bloodstream. As the blood comes around through the liver, the liver burns the alcohol into useful heat and energy. In moderate quantities, the liver treats alcohol as a quickly available food. The catch is that the liver can only burn up from one-sixth to one-third of an ounce of alcohol per hour. The unburned alcohol continues in the bloodstream, tending to concentrate in those body tissues that contain the most blood, and particularly in the brain. So the load of alcohol that the drinker takes on per hour is an important factor. The alcohol in all drinks is chemically about the same. The difference is in how much the alcohol is diluted. A bottle of ordinary four or five percent beer, for instance, contains something less than half an ounce of alcohol. A glass of strong wine carries about four-fifths of an ounce of alcohol. Mixed drinks vary, but may include about an ounce of alcohol. And straight whiskey up to an ounce and a half. Roughly, three beers equals one whiskey in a load of alcohol, but with somewhat less effect because of slower absorption and greater dilution. When more alcohol is coming into the blood than the body can burn up or eliminate, the higher centers of the brain, those in the cerebrum, are the first to be affected. These govern judgment and self-control. This means that reactions, timing, and judgment begin to get off the beam. Alcohol affects the brain of the drinker like shortage of oxygen does the brain of the airman. In both instances, performance is cut down, but the man does not know it. He may even think he's doing better when he's high. A man in this condition is dangerous behind the wheel of a car and should not be allowed to drive. By himself or in the company of others, he's apt to become foolish and do things he would never do when normal. He may be gay one minute and insulted the next and talk tough.
With still more alcohol, deeper centers of the brain are affected. Muscular control is lost. The man can't walk straight. His speech is incoherent. His vision blurred and his senses of pain and touch are blunted. The final stage of intoxication comes only after extremely large amounts of alcohol are absorbed. By now, the man is completely befuddled. If he's lucky, he falls into a stupor before he really gets hurt. Since the war, a systematic study has been undertaken to find out the extent of drinking in the United States and its social effects. Out of a total population of 150 million, there are about 110 million of drinking age. Of these, some 60 million use alcoholic beverages, mostly in moderation but almost four million, about one in every 15 drinkers, substantially harm themselves with alcohol. And of these, perhaps two million may be termed alcohol addicts, individuals whose use of alcohol is so uncontrolled that they need medical help. The real danger, real disease, if you will, is drunkenness. The drunken husband, the drunken wife, the drunken son or daughter, and the drunken motorist. The obvious cure for excessive social drinking is common sense moderation. If you are one of the more than 50 million non-drinkers in the United States, you form no part of the nation's liquor problem. You're free from it financially, and liquor is a mighty expensive pastime. Almost $9 billion a year is spent on it in the United States, the most expensive luxury item the world has ever known. You're free of the risk that faces every drinker, taking too much and winding up in trouble. For servicemen, that usually means AOL or other trouble on leave or liberty under the influence of alcohol. But so far as ordinary social drinking is concerned, the problem is to keep it social, in moderation, so that you don't actually lose whatever it is that you're drinking to get. This is where that first ounce or so of alcohol takes a tricky advantage. One drink calls for another. You may be feeling no pain, but you just don't think so good. Alcoholic relaxation, which starts with the upper levels of intelligence, may make a man less shy, but also less particular. Every man has a standard for what he considers attractive in the women he chooses. But a few drinks, well, can make a pickup look better. There's no truth in the notion that alcohol, in any amount, increases virility. A man may be less disgusted drunk than sober, but also less able to take care of himself, against VD, for example, or being rolled. And speaking of notions, the amount of alcohol it takes to make any certain man dizzy doesn't have any relation to how rugged, strong, or enduring he may otherwise be. It is a matter of body chemistry and dilution of the alcohol. Approximately 70% of the human body is water. If this man, weighing 120 pounds, drinks two ounces of whiskey, he will end up with a blood alcohol concentration of nearly two tenths percent. The same drink for this man, 165 pounds, would result in a blood alcohol concentration of only one tenth of a percent. And the same amount of alcohol in this heavy weight would dilute to well under one-tenth percent.
Among individuals of the same weight and condition, body chemistry varies. One has a more active liver to burn off the alcohol. One is tired and the liquor hits him quicker. There is no general rule for how much you can drink and still stay more or less sober. Diluting the alcohol and spacing out your drinks are useful if you want to keep your drinking social and in control. Eating food while you drink is a help. Food mixes with the liquor in the stomach and slows up absorption of alcohol into the blood. After the first one or two, the more nearly you space your drinks to the slow rate at which your body can burn up and eliminate the alcohol, the better chance your brain has of being literally pickled while you drink. We haven't discussed the chronic alcohol addicts and the lost weekenders. They are emotionally and physically sick people who need long-term treatment. But our William here needs the short-term treatment of wising up. He got a letter today about trouble in the family. In fact, his wife needs the benefit of all the thoughtfulness and sympathetic love and understanding that he could put into a reply. She could also use a few extra dollars. Did he write her? Well, no. But he's handling his problem in a big way. With its moral authority of individual conduct and social responsibility, organized religion has long taken a part in the treatment and prevention of excessive drinking. The chaplain has this word. Whether you are a Protestant, a Catholic, or a Jew, your religion teaches that excessive drinking is wrong. They all agree. It's wrong the minute that you lose control of yourself. Not only the first time, or after the tenth time, but each and every time. Now let's get it straight. Religion doesn't condemn drunkenness just to keep you from having a good time or to meddle in your private life. The purpose of religion is to help you along the highway of life. And you and I know that a drunk just doesn't have a chance on any highway. Self-control is basic to a man's sound judgment and to his standard of conduct. Science has taught us that alcohol in the body quickly decreases a man's power of self-control. It is no wonder, then, that we find in our Bible this rule for successful living. Let your moderation be known unto all men, for moderation is the sign of strength. It is the mark of manhood. Knowing some of the facts about alcohol and drinking and recognizing the risks involved, each man has the final responsibility to see and obey the stop signals when he meets them and to know when enough is enough.